Well, greetings, everyone. This is a, a great occasion because we have um, two special mushroomy guests tonight. My name is Guy Dauncey. I'm with, active with the Yellow Point Ecological Society. We do all sorts of things to do with nature and wildlife and trees and forests and land up here in the Yellow Point area. And our guest tonight, um, Andy McKinnon, who is the co-author of six best-selling books about the plants of Northwestern North America. He recently retired from a 30-year career as an ecologist with the research branch of the BC Ministry of Forests, Land and Natural Resources. He is, and get ready for this list, he is a professional forester, professional biologist, forest ecologist, an adjunct professor at Simon Fraser University and a Machosin counselor. And Andy's mushroom criminal in partner in crime is Ken Luther, who is a Canadian American writer who is at one time or another claimed to be a historian, a genealogist, a philosopher, a linguist, a scientist, and a field naturalist. His book, Boundary Layer, is a tour through the ground hugging organisms of the Pacific Northwest and an introduction to the fascinating people who study them. And so let's just open up the floor to you, Andy, and Ken to take it away. And I'll give you screen sharing. I'm sure you're going to want that. I think that's a good idea. In fact, you have I, it already. Yes. I believe I have it. Yes. Okay. And we will. And I should have said this evening is being co-hosted with the with Wildwood, the um, Ecoforestry Research Center, Ecoforestry Research Society. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to join you this evening. Um, Kim and I are going to take turns talking about species mushrooms and, and the process that we went through to put together a new handbook to the mushrooms of British Columbia, why we did it, how we did it. And it's going to be interspersed with a lot of the magnificent photos that were taken almost entirely by other people. Uh, that we use to illustrate the book. So we'll talk a bit about BC's mushrooms. We'll talk a bit about the process of putting the book together. Um, but we'll take some uh, a couple of breaks during the presentation so you can just sit back and enjoy all the beautiful photos of the beautiful mushrooms. All right, a bit of a bit of an eye candy break for people who can tough out the blah 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 from Kim and me. Sounds good. Okay, um, so Kim and I uh, are um, students of mushrooms. I did my master's in mycology in the study of fungi in 1982. Um, and we spend each autumn, have for a dozen years or more, every weekend at different fungus festivals, different mushroom courses, uh, and every year there seem to be more courses and festivals. So over the last couple of months, um, I or we have been to places as disparate as uh, Sycamuse, um, Tofino and Euclulet, uh, Bamfield for the Bamfield Fungus Festival, the Whistler Fungus Among Us Festival. Uh, uh, Alex and Lake. Cowichan Lake, Cumberland, uh, lots of different festivals, Main Island next weekend, I think. Um, and every year we would go to all these festivals and, and one of the most common questions we would receive is, um, what's a good beginning mushroom guide? And we were able to recommend a number of different guides, some of which you may be familiar with, things like David Aurora's uh, all that the rain promises and more, but they were always followed with a but. So there are a number of good guides that have been written by California and Oregon authors. And we would say this is a good guide for a beginning mushroomer, but uh, because it's written by someone from California, it includes a lot of mushrooms that don't make it as far north as British Columbia. And, and doesn't include some of the more northerly species. And, and the habitat information is never quite right for British Columbia. You might find out more about what species grow with uh, coast redwoods than with Douglas firs, for example. 
Um, and so eventually we decided that uh, the thing to do was to put a guide together. And uh, we we're very fortunate to get a chance to work with the Royal British Columbia Museum for two reasons. One was uh, because I and, and probably a number of people on this call tonight grew up with Royal British Columbia Museum handbooks to birds and salamanders and bats and marine invertebrates and so on. And, and the other is that the museum had published two previous handbooks to mushrooms in British Columbia. Uh, in 1946, they published George Hardy's Mushrooms and Other Fungi of British Columbia, um, which uh, had uh, fantastic illustrations by Frank Beebe, a uh, guide of about 90 pages with about 50 species of mushrooms. Then in 1964 and uh, revised in 1976, Robert Bandoni and Adam Shavinsky published a Guide to Common Mushrooms of British Columbia in the Museum Handbook series, which was about 170 pages long and contained about 150 species. Uh, and Robert Bandoni was actually my master's supervisor at, at UBC. Um, and the museum hasn't published a mushroom guide, uh, a new one since 1964, uh, though the 1976 revision of the Guide to Common Mushrooms of British Columbia, I think was the first museum handbook that featured color photographs. Um, anyway, there had not been a museum guide available for many decades. And so we put together a new guide, which we're going to tell you about tonight that has 500 pages and includes about 350 species as main entries with another 800 species profiled in the main entries. So in tonight's talk, we're gonna talk about how the book was made. We're then going to take a, a break to look at a lot of beautiful photographs of gilled and veined mushrooms. Uh, talk a bit about box essays and fun facts, how we're interacting with current research in building the book. Then a lot of photographs of beautiful non-gilled fungi, and then a very brief wrap up. I think the entire presentation will take somewhere between 45 minutes and an hour. And we hope to leave lots of time at the end for questions and discussion should anybody have them. So I think Kim is now going to talk a bit about making the book. Over to you, Kim. So just some, some of the, some of the uh, interesting things that we found in, in in going through uh, producing this book. Uh, next slide, yeah. The actual work on the new guide occupied about four years. Um, the concept of the book though is a lot older than this. Uh, as early as 1983, Andy and Paul Kroger had drawn up an initial prospectus for the book. Uh, needless to say, it didn't get done. Um, and as Andy mentioned, uh, in the last two decades, almost every discussion of print resources or mushrooms has included some kind of a lament that we didn't have a local book. In 2017, both Andy and I found ourselves looking for new writing projects and uh, the mushroom book finally popped to the top of the stack. Um, so after a search for a suitable publisher, we signed a contract with the BC Museum Press. Not only, of course, had the BC Museum Press published the two previous guides that Andy mentioned, it's also well known for its extensive series of BC natural history guides. You see a few of them there. The first task we had to do in putting this book together was to come up with a list of the mushroom species that were going to be in it, It'd be the equivalent of a writer making an outline at the beginning of an essay. Um, we needed help with this, so Ian Gibson, the developer of MycoMatch, and Shannon Birch, a mycologist with the Ministry of the Environment and the author with Paul Kroger of the checklist, the macrofungus species of BC, helped us to pull together a master list of all the fungi that had ever been recorded in BC. Ian and Shannon and Paul also helped us to whittle the list down. 
turns out BC has about 3,400 known species of mushroom. And there, we believe there are many thousands more that have, have never been documented in BC. Um, you can see how vast this field is. Um, to decide which ones to include, we assembled a large number of foray and archive lists and we checked the species frequency. Um, and we realized that Andy and I have a bit of a bias. We're both from the southwestern tip of BC, um, but uh, BC is a big place. You can put a couple of Californias in it with space left over. So we ran our lists by several mycologists who had specific interest in the interior and northern BC species to see if they felt that there were some important inclusions that we had missed. I'll just uh, uh, mention uh, the 3,400 known species of mushrooms. I'll be surprised if there are less than 10,000 species of mushrooms by the time we've recorded them all, which gives you an idea of the state of knowledge about fungi and, and mushrooms in British Columbia. It's extraordinary compared with uh, plants and animals. Uh, A, how many species there are, there's more species of fungi. This is just mushrooms. Uh, there are many, many more species of microfungi. So there's, there's more species of fungi than there are species of plants or animals. Um, and if we know uh, a third of the really obvious big mushrooms species, I will be surprised. Global estimates suggest that uh, certainly less than 1% of fungal species on Earth have been described scientifically and have a scientific name. So it's, it's that there are certainly at Wildwood, there will be fungal species new to science, absolutely guaranteed. You birders out there have it easy, you know, what, two or 300 species and, and you've got the list. So pity us poor mushroomers. Uh, it's a it's a huge field. Okay, next slide. Yeah, so we finally whittled the list down after much cutting and much blood to 350 species that we wanted to include as main entries. We uh, prepared sample pages with photographs and descriptions, and we confirmed with the press that they could accommodate our text and picture requirements. They could. Uh, so in addition to the pictures and descriptions, we also wanted to include about uh, two dozen feature essays specifically on BC mycology. What do mushrooms mean to people in BC? Uh, we'll talk more about that in a bit. Uh, we'd also planned initially to include identification keys, but then we realized to include them, we'd have to drop about 50 species. And uh, it, there actually is a trend right now in sort of beginner intermediate books to leave out the keys. Um, these are available in more advanced books. With the book mapped out, we started to write. And in the course of generating 150,000 words about BC mushrooms, we consulted 500 journal articles, many books and mushroom guides, and innumerable web pages. To make the book more accessible, we gave special attention to vocabulary. Most of you who have some science background realize that to participate in a research community means you have to master a technical vocabulary. But these large technical vocabularies, while they're necessary for the disciplines to, to do their work well, they create very high bars for beginners. What do mushroom newbies make of words like annulus, lacanose, scrobiculate, adnate, and fusoid? But you can't open a mushroom book without running into these terms. And uh, so we, we wanted to do something about that. So wherever possible, we replace technical terms with more transparent phrases. As the different sections of the new mushroom book were generated, they were sent out to experts uh, in the various groups to, uh, for comments and corrections. Uh, several people looked at the entire text, for example, Paul Kroger, who not only looked at the entire text, he also took a look at our picture choices. In parallel with the writing task, uh, we began to search for, um, oh, okay, we've lost our, 
slides there. Okay, it looks like Len Wenzel has started screen saving now. Screen sharing, yeah. Screen sharing, yes. Oh, okay, I'll try again here. Let's see. And uh, you're good again. Yeah, just go to full screen. There we go. That's where we are. So we will go from the current slide. Here we go, Kim. And go back. Oh, yeah, here we are. Yeah. So um, we began a search for about 400 photos to include with the book. Um, Andy and I are, you know, we take pictures for our own uses, but we're not really photographers. So we contacted, uh, we knew a lot of people who, who were very serious photographers. That's uh, one of the major uh, avenues of participation in mushrooms is mushroom photography. So we, we contacted photo photographers from all over Western Canada and the US Pacific Northwest and asked them if they would share their photos with us and let us use them. And we, we were overwhelmed. We received about 15,000 candidate photos from about 100 photographers. So picking out the best photos for each species uh, was, was uh, one of the most difficult and the most, and the, and the most fun tasks of the book. For most of the photos, we, we, we had our eye out for images that illustrated important features that were highlighted in our descriptions. But sometimes we were just so overwhelmed with the beauty of the photos, we chose them. Uh, and you see here the, the white Erasmus, uh, which we, I just saw today in the field uh, by James Holko. For some sections of the book, especially the introduction, line drawings were more appropriate than photographs. And so uh, we enlisted the help of Dr. Kara Gibson. She provided us with a set of about 30 amazing drawings. And finally, uh, in June, 2020, we were ready and we submitted all at once our uh, photographs and texts. I had my wife come into my study and take a picture of me when I hit the enter button to send it, you know, celebrating the end of uh, four years of, uh, of, uh, of hard work. But that wasn't the end of our work on the book. Uh, that simply began the long task of book layout, cover design, copy editing, fact checking, proofreading, indexing. A large production team was ably coordinated, coordinated by Eve Rickert, the editor and publisher at BC Museum Press. The formal publication of the book happened last month. Um, an ebook version is also available. Um, and copies, uh, <laughs> they can be ordered through the museum, yes, although they don't have any at this point, uh, and other print book outlets. There are still copies out there in bookstores. Um, and uh, it, uh, it is available or soon will be throughout BC bookstores. Andy. All right, so now we're, we're going to take a, uh, a break from uh, the rest of the presentation and we're just gonna look at some pretty pictures. So I'd like everybody to sit back in their chairs, grab their glass of Chardonnay and uh, prepare to, uh, to enjoy some of these beautiful photos. I hope you'll enjoy them as much as, as we did. Um, and, and Andy, people are welcome to put comments in the chat if they, you know, have seen the from Mushroom locally or whatever they want to say. So have a good old time in the chat while this is happening. Absolutely. And, and feel free to, if, if you come up with a question that you want to have answered at the end or a discussion point, please put it in the chat too, so that uh, we can be sure and capture all those good ideas. So one of the major differences uh, between this and some of the other regional guides that are available is, as Kim mentioned, we took almost none of the photos. And I think the book is better for it uh, because we were able to eventually select the 400 or so photos in the book from more than 70 photographers. Uh, some of them professional photographers and some of them, while not professional photographers, spending an awful lot of their free time doing it. So we've got a lot of beautiful photos like this photo of the woolly inky cap 
Copronopsis lagopus group taken by Tyson Ellers, a friend from the West Kootenays who helped us out with distributional information for Southeastern British Columbia. This is one of the group of inky cap mushrooms whose gills dissolve into black goo at maturity. We should see uh, at least uh, one or two representatives of the group tomorrow. Here's a couple of exceptionally good photos that weren't included in the book, unfortunately, because they were judged to be too rude to be in a mushroom guide. Um, and so here are some ones that we did include. Um, as I go through these photos, uh, try and imagine the work that the photographers must have gone through to get these photos. A lot of the best ones are taken at a mushroom level, which probably involves the photographer spending an awful lot of time on her or his belly in some very wet places. So Andy, is that the same Rich Mabley who's the wildlife specialist back in England? It is not. No, this is the this is a different Rich Mabley who is a photographer from uh, the south end of Vancouver Island. Uh -huh. Apologies we, to this Rich. <laughs> we have a lot of his uh, his uh, beautiful photos in here, like this pig's ear gompus clabatus, the woolly milk cap Lactarius torminosus by Christian Schwartz, who was one of the co-authors of the uh, wonderful new guide, Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast from California. The parrot waxy cap, again, another of Rich's photos. Um, and we'll talk a bit later on about all the name changes that have taken place lately. We used to say, um, you can count on the scientific names and common names come and go. Uh, it's actually turned out to be exactly the opposite over the last decade. And the parrot waxy cap, uh, which some people might know as hygrosopy or hygrophorus citocinus is now in gliophorus, but it's still beautiful. Someone's asking if that one is poisonous. Uh, we don't know. It probably isn't, but uh, it really is too small to. If we find it, if we find it tomorrow, we'll try it on somebody, and then we'll have a better idea. <laughs> I, I would say probably well, certainly the vast majority of mushrooms in British Columbia we're not certain whether they're poisonous or not. <laughs> the sheathed powder caps, Cystoderma phallax. Again, by Tyson Ellers. So this was taken in the West Kootenays. And uh, you can see the beautiful rings on the stems of this pair, which are characteristic of this species of cystoderma. This sort of looks like two, two women from the 1920s with the big hats, you know, talking to each other over tea. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you can see the veil remnants around the edge of the cap from the universal veil that used to protect the gill when it was younger. And you can also tell, I think, something about the, the, uh, the size of some of these mushrooms um, simply by looking at the, the mosses that surround them in this case. There are photos of mushrooms like the yellow waxy cap here by Steve Ness that you don't actually have to go to the description of the mushroom to appreciate just how gooey the cap is. The, uh, the photo tells it all, I think. Another really slimy mushroom, um, that, uh, the dripping slime cap, which has captured uh, an insect in its slime here. One of a number of great photos by Kit Skates Barnhart who uh, the late great Kit Skates Barnhart, who died many years ago, and her photos were made available to us by Michael Bugue. The Lilac Guild Umbrella by Sava Christic. Just a beautiful mushroom and a, a gorgeous photo of it. That mushroom is a couple of centimeters tall, if you're wondering about scale. So 
whenever possible, we used photos from British Columbia. When that wasn't possible, we used photos from adjacent jurisdictions like Washington or Montana, uh, with one exception. And that is this photo of a grass green russula here, which was taken in Finland. Uh, and in, in our defense, the DNA signature of this photographed mushroom uh, is identical to the DNA signature of species of grass green russula that grow in the Pacific Northwest, including British Columbia. So we know it's the same thing, and it's the one exception uh, to the photos all being local photos. Most of the mushrooms in the guide are just straight up mushrooms. Uh, this is an exception. This is the fungal fruiting body of a lichen called Lichen omphalia umbellifera. Uh, so it's, it's not the fruiting body of a straight up fungus, it's the fruiting body of a lichen. And if you look around the base of these little fruiting bodies, you can find the green balls that represent their, their algal partners in the lichen. Most of our lichens have um, the large fungal group ascomycetes as their partners, um, but a few of them have the large fungal group basidiomycetes as partners. And so when they fungi involved in those lichens make their fruiting bodies, they often look like little mushrooms, like like an omphalia. Sometimes a photo like this one of the slippery mycena by Sava Kurstik um, is so diagnostic that you can just tell a mushroom is going to be awfully difficult to pick up. Look at the, the gooey slime at the base of those mushrooms, backlit gooey slime, a fabulous photo. And again, those mushrooms are not more than two centimeters tall. Here's a bigger mushroom, the, the prince, Agaricus augustus, which will be familiar, I bet, to some of the people with us here tonight. One of the best edibles in our part of the world. Um, and I look at a photo like that and I can practically see those mushrooms in my fry pan at breakfast. You can practically smell the almond odor, I think, from that beautiful photo by Richard Morrison, who also took the, uh, the cover photo for the book. The yellow gilled Jim, Gymnopolis luteifolius, and Caleb is obviously getting down on his belly to shoot this photo of the yellow gilled Jim from below. Kaufman's root shank by Scott Redhead, one of Canada's top mushroom experts. And this is a species that is um, uh, almost entirely confined to old growth forests, which is to say in British Columbia, it's a species in peril. If you need any more reason to spring to the defense of BC's old growth forests, uh, fungi can help. There are a number of fungi that we find only in old growth forests. The rosy gonfidius, we'll probably see this tomorrow, a very common mushroom on southern Vancouver Island by Richard Morrison. The vermilion waxy cap, Hygrosibi miniata, again by Rich Maidley, wouldn't be surprised to see this turn up tomorrow. The blue green stropharia, a photo by Taylor Lockwood. Um, we also included box, what we called box essays and fun facts in the book. I think I carry on here. Do I, Ken? Yes, uh, this yeah. is your part. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. Um, uh, so uh, the book, like any uh, guide to any group of organisms provides pictures and written descriptions, but that doesn't reflect all of the different aspects of fungal fun in British Columbia. So 
to represent the larger picture of the many ways that people interact with mushrooms in BC. Uh, about 10% of the book uh, is reserved for what we call boxed essays. There's a couple of dozen of these essays. Uh, and uh, they're fun cameos of the many meanings and uses of BC mushrooms. So in the book, you'll find one or usually two page essays on root and butt rots, uh, death cap arriving in British Columbia, and a whole host of other topics. I'm not going to go through the entire list, but I'll, I'll provide a few examples and some photos that we included just for fun, like Adam Brett finding his very first pine musher, an important day for any young lad or lass. <clears throat> so BC has played a world recognized role in popularizing magic mushrooms. So we have an essay on magic mushrooms. Here's a picture of the wavy cap, Psilocybe cyanescens. And here's a picture of Paul Marcano with Liberty Caps uh, taken in 1980 in a farmer's field near the ferry terminal in Tawasson. Uh, between 1979 and 1982, the possession of magic mushrooms in British Columbia was not illegal. That just happened to be exactly the same through years I was doing my master's at UBC as well. Um, what a coincidence. What a coincidence. And uh, since 1982, they have been uh, illegal once again. But BC was quite famous for magic mushrooms in Canada and really in North America. And, and the essay explains why that was. Uh, there's an essay on medicinal mushrooms. Uh, the um, the 5,000-year-old Otzi, the ice man, melted out of the ice on the Austrian border um, probably 15 years ago, I think now. And uh, he, was, he was much studied. And, and one of the things that he carried with him uh, were two different uh, sets of conchs of, of bracket fungi, um, and one of which was uh, birch conchs here. Uh, which were almost certainly used medicinally as a vermifuge and, and for other purposes. Uh, the other fungus that he carried was the tinder conch as part of his fire starting and fire carrying kit. So there's a long history, at least five millennia, uh, of use of fungi medicinally, probably much longer than that in traditional Chinese medicine. A growing number of people in British Columbia have been getting heavily into using mushrooms and lichens to dye fabric. And uh, it's, it's a, a passion, a growing passion for a lot of people. So we included an, an essay on using mushrooms to dye fabric. Um, lovely picture of Alyssa Allen on the docks of Lake Washington here with a variety of different dyed dyes, all of those dyed using uh, mushrooms and lichens. Uh, there's a, a box essay called Zombie Ants and Other Horrors, uh, where we talk about uh, a group of, of fungi, which uh, all used to be called cordyceps, and a lot of them have, have different names now. If anybody here wants to spend a sleepless night of terror, I highly recommend going onto YouTube and looking up some of the videos about zombie ants. Okay. And uh, this is a group of fungi, the cordyceps fungi, which uh, infect various insects in British Columbia, including ants and beetles. And also in BC, they they infect uh, some of our truffles and parasitize them. Um, and with the insects, what these uh, fungi do is they eat the insects from the inside and then they affect the behavior of the insects in ways that cause the insects to do things that they would never do otherwise. 
uh, but that are to the advantage of the fungus. And with zombie ants, best studied in tropical systems, the ants will uh, walk away from their colonies. They'll walk up to places that are high and dry, like the underside of leaves, uh, where no ant in its right mind would ever go. Uh, then uh, all the while with the fungus eating them from inside and also directing their motions, that's why they call them zombie ants, uh, clamp their mandibles on the underside of the leaf. And when they're securely in place, the fungus will finally kill them and then fruit through its head from a high dry place where it can dis distribute its spores. Uh, a good BC example is shown here, the 10 line June beetle, uh, which in the dunes around Tofino and Euclid is commonly parasitized by one of these cordyceps fungi. And the fungus causes these June beetles to do things that no June beetle in their right mind would ever do, such as climb up out of the sand into really open places where predators could easily find them and up to high places on the dune, which are the perfect places for the fungus to distribute its spores. Not a good place for the June beetles. And Andy, and this is just, we're doing this just three days before Halloween, so your timing is perfect. Oh, exactly. There are lots of other really scary things about fungi, but in this case, here's the June beetle that once the fungus gets the June beetle to where it wants to be, it then finally kills the June beetle. And in the case of Ophiocordyceps ravenellii, it sends two fruiting stalks up through the eyeball sockets of the dead beetle. And that's what the two items that look kind of like legs with bent knees on the left-hand side of this photo are. Those are the fruiting stalks of the Ophiocordyceps uh, through the eyeball sockets of the dead uh, June beetle. Uh, it's pretty scary, uh, but some of the people who sent us the photos uh, presumably weren't quite so scared of these June beetles uh, with their fungal parasite. Here's Megan and Liza. Uh, with Ophiocordyceps ravenellii, and they seem to be experimenting with the Ophiocordyceps. The Cordyceps fungi are also known as uh, potent aphrodisiacs, and Cordyceps sinensis is worth many times um, the weight of uh, the value of its weight, many times more than gold when it's collected uh, largely from the Tibetan highlands and made available as an aphrodisiac. Um, this is one that is locally called uh, West Coast Woody. Um, so miles and miles of text, even with great photographs can get a little uh, tedious. Uh, we also included stories, quips and factoids, uh, poetry, and, and uh, quotations from theater. And we thank the BC Museum Press for letting these slip through the copy editing process. Uh, they're not marked in the text. Uh, as you read through the book, uh, you may come upon some of them, uh, such as a cameo appearance by Sasquatch, a mycologist in serious need of a name shave a mushroom that ends like a rainbow in a pot of gold, the winner of the world's ugliest mushroom award, Aunt Eddie's quest to save the morals of housemaids, Arthur Conan Doyle's foul pustules, and the only mycologist to die from mushroom poisoning. If you're interested in any of these, we might be tempted to reveal one or two of them in the question period at the end. I don't know, Kim, depends how much we're willing to have our arms twisted. Over to you, Kim. Okay, uh, in, in uh, putting this book together, we had to react pretty intensely with current research in mycology. Uh, so a little bit about that. Um, of course, you, you might ask, when is a good time to write a mushroom guide? And for the last 20 years, the answer has been not yet. Uh, molecular studies of mushroom species have been roiling the taxonomic waters and changing a lot of the 
categories that we use. Until the 1990s, all studies of mushroom taxonomy were based on morphology, uh, both the macro and the micro morphology, with input from a few mating studies and some chemi chemical analyses. But today, in contrast, it is probably not possible to publish a major taxonomic study of any mushroom group without also doing DNA analysis. Producing a guide that makes use of current research means that there will be a lot of name changes um, and that the guide will quickly fall out of date and that some of the mushrooms, we won't be able to get down to exact species because we're fairly confused from these DNA studies of exactly what we have here. When space allowed, we tried to call attention to the state of current research in our comments section um, I, I wrote uh, eloquent paragraphs on each of the mushrooms, which Andy edited down to one sentence, but uh, rightly so, because uh, you, you can't do much in a beginner's guide. But we tried to give you some idea in the comments section of what's happening with these mushrooms in, in current research. Those, for example, let's take a brief look at some recent name changes included in the book. Uh, the blue chanterelle, uh, a, a, a joy to find when you find it. Uh, for years, we call this polyozelis multiplex, but it has been studied recently, and it turns out that that's actually an umbrella concept for at least five distinct species. And if, if it has dark blue, if it's dark blue and it's young, very likely it is, in fact, polyozelis atrolazulinus, uh, which was recently described. The common BC rushlas with red caps and red flushes on the stem and creamy gills uh, and peppery tastes have gone by many different names. You'll see them listed in, in, in four A lists as uh, Russia rosacea or sanguin, sanguinea or sanguinaria. But all of these names are European names. They, are, they, are, they, were, they were invented in Europe and, uh, and described there originally. And what we have is slightly different. Um, a rather large study of, uh, of Russia DNA was carried out uh, about four years ago now by Anna Baza Kalupo. And uh, we, we discovered that a lot of our Rushlas were not, even though they had the European names, they were not the same species. So a new name was created for this one uh, by Anna and uh, she called it Rushla rhodocephala and that's the name we used in the book. We once believed that we had, uh, speaking of a Halloween guy, uh, we once believed we had a world spanning species of witch's hat, <laughs> Hagrasa biconica, but uh, it turned out, uh, it turns out now that it's a group of similar species, uh, not a single species. And one of these, H. singeri, uh, was mainly known from Western North America. <clears throat> so that was our name of choice for the book. But in fact, it turns out now that uh, Singeri itself is a species complex, so more name changes may be in store. We may have to break this down. Uh, let's, uh, let's skip this one, go to the next one. The red crack Boletes, uh, Boletus chrysanteron, uh, was moved uh, some time ago, 12 years ago, 13 to zero camellus. And we're just getting used to this now, but uh, the, the zero camellus chrysanteron group uh, is a European complex. And uh, it turns out that in this group, the one that's found here when they do DNA studies is zero camellus diffractus. So that was our, our, our name of choice for the book. This hedgehog, many of you know hedgehogs, right? Uh, and the big hedgehog, we always called hidden or pandem, but according to the DNA studies that have been done, we, we may not have this species in North America. So we have reverted to a, a species that was described back in the 1890s, which is very similar to it. And we know that this occurs in BC and in the state of Washington. Um, so that's the one we use in the book. Our most common conch is perhaps the red belted conch. I'm sure you've all seen this, and we, we always call this Thermotopsis panicula. But a, a study of this discovered that there were at least four distinct species that were hiding under this one name, and two of them we have in BC. The one on the right is Thermotopsis mountsii, 
And the one on the left without as much color is Spomatopsis ochrosia. Um, and uh, so we've, we've, uh, we've presented in the book, the Fomatopsis mounsii. Here's a few, I, I won't go through this. These are some other name changes in the book, but I'd just like to highlight this one you see with the asterisk. Uh, uh, when, uh, when Noah Siegel and Christian Swartz put together um, the mushrooms uh, of the Redwood Coast, they uh, Noah more or less started to stopwatch uh, the day they published it. And he wanted to know how long would it be before there was a mushroom in the book that had didn't have the right name. And they made it four months. And he thought that was pretty good. Uh, we, we beat him. Uh, the day we published our book, uh, one of the names was out of date. Uh, we, had, we had taken the Gymnopus perinatus, which, uh, uh, was what we used to call it, and we proudly renamed it as Marasmielis. And uh, the, the year, you know, this last year, a new study was published, and it's pretty clear from this one that it's going to be moved to Calibiopsis. So, this is the problem, you see, of, of trying to 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 publish a, a mushroom book in the current climate. Next slide. We also committed ourselves, so much for scientific names, we also committed ourselves to providing a common name. And uh, this is not a small thing. Uh, you can pick out any mushroom book on my shelf here and look at it and you'll find a few common names, but, but they're not all, they don't have common names for all of them. The British Mycological Society has a long-term project to find good English names for all of their fungi. But there's no North American compendium of uh, common names, even though we've discussed such a project endlessly. Um, so uh, we, but we decided that we were going to provide a common name uh, for every species. So that meant we had to make up some names and we had a lot of fun doing this. Next slide. Uh, <clears throat> the common names of mushrooms are often funny uh, for good reason, because you remember them. Like, who can forget cowboy's handkerchief for the white, super slimy Hygrophorus abernius, or the stinker for the odorous Tricholoma sulfurium group. So we tried to make some of the fabricated common names funny. Uh, the, the one I mentioned, Rushula rhodus cephala, uh, we called the red hot Rushula. Uh, Hypsigus tessellatus, uh, which is a, 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 a charismatic mushroom uh, uh, that grows on most land poplar trees didn't have a common name. So we call it hip pop, hip pop. You see, guy is looking puzzled, but he'll get it. Uh, <laughs> the uh, Leucopaxillus gentianus, as you see on the right there, from head height looks, looks all the world like a pancake laying on the ground. So we called it the pancake mushroom. Andy. So uh, we'll take another break here and, and look at some more of the beautiful photos that uh, were contributed by photographers. Um, there's Abigail clutching a bear's head mushroom, which was the photo I wanted on the cover of the book, but the museum wouldn't go for it because they thought that people would assume that it was just a children's mushroom guide, um, which I take exception to. However, I lost that one. Uh, so about 40% of the main entries in the book are non-guild fungi. That, that uh, is a large group of fungi. Uh, we describe them in different sections as clubs, corals, jellies, boletes, tooth, and so on. And so here are some of the pictures of these non-gilled mushrooms. One of the world's most sought after edibles, the King Bolete. And I think uh, Richard, Rich Mabley has, uh, has captured it just beautifully here with this pair of delicious looking King Boletes, uh, showing very, very nicely the net-like reticulation on the stem which is characteristic of the king boletes. While we're with the boletes, the aspen scaber stalks, Lexinum insigne by Kit Skates Barnhart, again, uh, very helpfully with an aspen trunk in the background, which is the species of tree that it grows with. 
the bear's head, uh, which is a mushroom that grows quite high up in trees oftentimes. You might need a ladder to access some fruitings of the bear's head. Uh, coincidentally taken by the tallest of our photographers, Daryl Thompson. Uh, this one is called Bear's Head in the book, but another common name for it that I really like is the Frozen Waterfall. Purple Fairy Club, uh, which we may see tomorrow by Richard Morrison. And the flat top candy club, Claveria, Delph Claveria delphus truncatus. This is one of the few mushrooms that we um, see in British Columbia that is truly sweet and would make a very nice dessert to a fungal meal. The pink tipped coral, there's lots of coral mushrooms. We should find some of them tomorrow and we can talk a little bit about how difficult some of them are to identify the species, but this is a beautiful photo of this one. The truffle eater, this is one of our club shaped fungi. This requires a short bit of explanation. This is another one of those cordyceps type fungi, the zombie ants type fungi, only in this case, it's parasitizing truffles. So you get two fungi for one, two mushrooms for one in this photo. The round objects at the bottom are actually truffles, the deer truffle uh, that are growing underground. You can see where the dirt line is on them. And the easiest way to find them sometimes is they get parasitized by this polypocladium and it st sticks up above the ground. And you know, if you excavate below these polypocladiums, you're going to find deer truffles. Some fungi have teeth rather than gills or pores underneath, like the red paint fungus, Echinodontium, uh, which has been used for millennia in BC by First Nations for dyeing things red. The Western varnished conch, Ganoderma oregonense, our closest uh, related relation to the uh, reishi or lingchi mushroom of Japan and China, respectively, uh, Ganoderma lucidum. And this is one that's uh, locally gathered and employed medicinally to treat a variety of ailments. The conifer sulfur shelf, also known as chicken of the woods. And uh, this is an edible that probably some people here tonight have gathered and eaten. There's a lot of jelly fungi out there, like the purple jelly drops, Asco carini. Alpine jelly cone, haven't seen too much of it this year, but usually it's common and abundant. Uh, like most, almost all of the jelly fungi, it's edible but tasteless. This is the hardwood witch's butter, Tremella mesenterica. Uh, and there is a softwood witch's butter as well, which is entirely unrelated to the hardwood witch's butter, strangely enough. Um, lots of witches, elves, and fairies once you get into the mysterious world of fungi. The Western giant puffball, which is primarily known from interior British Columbia. I've, I've seen it as far west as the Pemberton Valley, but there is an outlier population in Machosa, where Kem and I live. Just uh, west of Victoria. Here is the Bowl Earth Star, another killer photo by Rich Mabley. Eyelash Cup, Scutellinia scutellata by Kent Brothers. You can see the, the dark hairs on the outside that look like eyelashes. Again, this is one to one and a half centimeters across, probably these little orange cups. Uh, Saddle-shaped false morel from the Kootenays here, Gyromitra infula by Tyson Ellers. And we have probably four dozen recorded species of truffles in British Columbia, probably a lot more than that. 
but not many of the desirable, edible, very expensive variety, though we do have a few of those, including the fall western white truffle, tuber oregonense, which has been documented as growing with Douglas fir on southern Vancouver Island. We also included a number of fungi that, while most people wouldn't class them as mushrooms, might catch people's attention like the hexagonal leaf spot uh, here growing on an Oregon grape leaf where the, the uh, kind of jigsaw puzzle like lines represent uh, the boundaries between incompatible colonies of the fungus growing on this Oregon grape leaf. Here's a box of coral fungi from one foray showing the rainbow of colors that you might find if you're collecting a lot of different coral fungi. And bird's nest fungi. We should find bird's nest fungi tomorrow. And uh, they have their spores clustered in these little peridioles, which look for all the world like eggs inside a bird's nest and are dispersed when a drop of rain falls into the cup and blows all the little peridials out. So I'll just finish by saying that if you get a copy of the book, you'll see my name and Ken's on the cover, but the book actually represents the efforts of a very large group of people. Uh, people, as Kim mentioned, that uh, from different parts of the province that reviewed our material for how well it worked in different parts of the province, everything from the species we would include to our habitat and season descriptions. We had a number of people, it just blew me away, a lot of the best people in the world in some of these genera, we contacted them and they, without exception, said, sure, we'll help. Uh, we had people we could approach with our sticky taxonomic questions, people to review a number of the essays, and of course, all of the photographs and illustrations that we've talked about in the book, and the people who helped put it together. Uh, more than anything else, I think what we learned from doing this book is that mycology is never a solo effort, and it takes a community to raise a book. Uh, and here are a bunch of us including Cam on the far left and me in the front center uh, at Whistler Fungus Among Us Festival in 2013. And that was the material that we wanted to present, but we wanted to leave lots of room, Guy, for questions and discussion afterwards. Well, that's, that's fantastic, Andy. So let me say, we must, we must we must leave room for some fungal questions. So don't conk out, don't forget your morals, don't get a flush around your gills or get slime in your cap or truffle your puffballs, don't reticulate your candy club, but do come up with good questions. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I think Joyce Lee has been sitting on various comments about the association with Gary Oak Forest. Joyce, do you want to unmute yourself and ask away? calling on Joyce, Joy Lee. Maybe Joy's not got a microphone available. So let me just put her questions to you from the, um, she's saying, are any mycorrhizal with Quercus gariana or puffballs mycorrhizal with grasses? Ah, okay. Well, I'll take the first half. And for the, while Andy's doing that, for the rest of you, get your questions up and in the chat and we'll get to as many as you can. And Kim, and Kim or I will take the second half. I'll take the first half because Dr. Shannon Birch and I uh, have a project. Uh, other people are involved and have been involved looking at the, the fungi that are associated with the roots of Gary Oak. So... Um, Mycorrhizal fungi, the fungi associated with the roots of plants, uh, they are connected to more than 90% of plant species on earth. So mycorrhizae are common and abundant. Uh, and we know a fair bit about 
most of the tree species in British Columbia, but very little about the fungi associated with the roots of Gary Oak. Uh, so we have, uh, we've had students at the Mary Burby lab at UBC, and we have a co-op student now at UVic will be out in the field with you folks tomorrow morning, and I'll be out in the field with her tomorrow afternoon, uh, sampling the roots of Gary Oak. Uh, so we're looking at the fungi that are growing with the roots and also with the fruiting bodies that pop up around Gary Oak trees. And what we're finding is there appear to be a very large number of undescribed species that grow associated with the roots of Gary Oak. There are, for example, at least four species of uh, what we believe to be Helvella that we have the genetic signatures for that don't match the genetic signatures of any Helvella that anyone else has listed in the literature and that don't match the genetic sequences of any Helvella in the collections at the BD Biodiversity Museum. Sorry, do you so, want to jump in and... and... Joy, I know you've unmuted yourself. Do you want to come back to them? Nope. Okay. Anyway, so, so the bottom line is uh, there is research uh, ongoing as we speak, including yeah. tomorrow afternoon after we're done with you folks, trying to sort out the different mycorrhizal fungi associated with Gary Oak. And invite me back in a couple of years and I'll give you a better answer. So we, we've got two Christinas on the call. One Christina is saying, are either of you familiar with myco remediation practices in Greater Victoria? And Christina James is asking, what has happened to the species name in the Herichium family? Ah, okay. Um, I, I don't know of any micro remediation projects underway right now in the Capital Regional District. And can you tell us what a micro remediation oh, project is? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, fungi are uh, remarkable uh, organisms for breaking down complex organic compounds. And uh, they are some of the best organisms on earth for breaking down celluloses and lignans in, in forested ecosystems, but have also demonstrated their worth in breaking down petrochemical compounds, uh, naphthalenes, uh, polychlorinated biphenyls, um, that have been demonstrated in the laboratory and to some extent in the field. Uh, so it's a form of environmental remediation carried out by fungi, which is what the myco is. And so there's a whole field of inquiry looking at approaches to uh, cleaning up um, environmental messes, toxic ingredients using fungi like uh, very, very commonly used uh, oyster mushroom. So Ruth Caspell is asking, do you know if turkey tail and red belted polypores have similar medicinal properties? Uh, you want to take that one, Cam, or shall I? Yeah, um, I, red belted polypore, the, the red belted conch is not, uh, not generally cited uh, much as a, uh, a therapeutic uh, mushroom, although there are people that that, uh, that do use it, but uh, but the the uh, uh, turkey tail has uh, uh, remarkable uses. Uh, you can go into an Asian uh, medical shop uh, uh, and uh, find turkey tail compounds. Uh, it's often used to uh, combat cancer or just as a general immune system booster. Um, so, I mean, this is a very, we have one box essay on, on medicinal mushrooms and we cover the whole field in two pages, right? It's, it's a huge field and uh, there's a lot of work being done on the compounds that are in mushrooms and how they might apply, might have medical uses. So it, Joy, it, it, it was, uh, I'll just add, it, it was one of the most difficult issues that we dealt with in the mushroom guide mm. because you can find, um, uh, well-argued reports that say that uh, there's uh, no evidence um, that any mushroom has any medicinal value at all. 
Uh, there's a, an article by a fellow named Money that came out a couple of years ago that argued that. And then there are books like Robert Rogers' Fungal Pharma Pharmacy or Pharmacopoeia um, that talk about all of the hundreds of species that we have in British Columbia that are important medicinals. And to some extent, it depends how much weight you give to thousands of years of use in traditional Chinese medicine versus the standards that are applied to a lot of medicinals in Western medicine, which is uh, controlled, double-blind clinical trials. Mm -hmm. And if you use the Western standards, you would probably say that very few of them, there's uh, compelling evidence that they're medicinal. If you go with traditional Chinese medicine, there's a, a lot of evidence over thousands of years. So, you know, it's where you settle. With, with respect to the Ganoderma organense, the only study I know of was done at UBC by Jeff Chilton and Associates. And it showed that our BC uh, species don't contain the same glucan compounds that are believed to be the active ingredients of Ganoderma lucidum. Uh, but that hasn't stopped people from gathering and using them in British Columbia. So um, Emily is asking where she can get information about the field trip tomorrow. And the answer is actually it's full up. Um, we didn't want to have more than 25 people so as to sort of allow for a bit of spacing and to be able to hear what Andy and Ken were saying. So it's happening a while ago, but it's full up. And let me see, um, the Joy is asking about Tuberia, if it has been found here yet. Tuberia, Tuberia? I, by here, yeah. I, I'm wondering, do you mean at Yellow Point? No, here well, could mean the South Island, I think. Oh, yeah, well, the Christmas Tuberia is uh, it, it's, it's a, a mushroom that uh, we only became aware of about uh, 10 years ago, 10 or 15, and it was largely up here through the work of Adolf and Luna Cheska. Um, they co-authored the, the study of this. It's a red mushroom that occurs late in the season. So we sometimes call it the Christmas now, Korea. Um, and it only grows in one place, and that is in the decaying uh, 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 trunks of um, arbutus trees. And, uh, and it was thought to be extremely rare. Uh, however, uh, I have found this mushroom several times around here. In fact, if you go to any, any good stand of arbutus around here, where you have the larger trees where there's some decay happening and uh, look in them uh, in mid-November, you, you very often see this mushroom. Hmm. So Christina James is asking, can someone, one of you talk about the Herichium family? Well, um, we just covered two of them in the book and there's really, they're, 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 we mentioned another, another two in there, I think. Um, it, it's it's a larger family, but we really only have two main ones here, and that's the the lion's mane and the bear's head. Um, they they are decaying mushrooms. Uh, they're both delicious, and uh, the lion's mane in particular has been grown commercially lately. Uh, I I've been spending quite a bit of time in Halifax lately, and when you go down to the big market on on the pier there, there's a mushroom grower that has huge boxes of these of these lions made and uh, it's wonderful to buy them and to cook them um the one of the interesting things about the herisium is that uh, as a as a decay mushroom it will continue to come back each year as long as there is substrate for it to metabolize and uh, so if you know where one is uh you can go and collect it and then the next year it's a good chance it's going to be in the same spot if nobody beats you to it. Uh, so people often have their herisium spots. Uh, they go to, and when we were at Whistler uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Kevin Trim, uh, our mushroom whisperer in the area, um, went out and found a, uh, a, a bear's head that uh, when it came down from the tree occupied an entire cooler uh, just, to carry, just for him to, to, to carry it home in. Uh, they can get quite large. The, the, uh, the bear's head is another important medicinal uh, as well. 
and uh, I don't know if the question was referring to this, but the names have changed a bit over the last decade in the genus Herisium. So I have a question about what you know about indigenous use of mushrooms. Ah. Mm -hmm. um, not nearly as much as we know about indigenous use of plants. And uh, this is a conversation we've been having with Nancy Turner and others that uh, if you look at the records of the early explorers uh, and the early ethnobotanists, there's quite a bit of information about traditional use of plants and uh, almost nothing about traditional use of fungi. So either they did not use the fungi for a lot of different things. We have an essay on fungi in First Nations and some of the fungi were used, um, but nothing like what we know about plants. So either they weren't using them to any great extent or they weren't prepared to tell the ethnobotanists about the use of the fungi. Uh, both of which are, are excellent possibilities. Um, it may very well be that since most of our delicious edible mushrooms arrive just about the same time of year that the salmon are returning to the streams that people were otherwise occupied. <laughs> yeah, I, I, we need to, this is the old question, is when, when does the absence of evidence become the evidence of absence? Uh, there's, a, there's a lot we don't know, and we, maybe there's nothing to know out there. Um, <clears throat> but we, we should recognize that all around the world, cultures often take uh, holistic cultural views of mushrooms. For example, and if, you, if you were part of the UK uh, uh, cultural scene over the last uh, three or four centuries, um, you may have culturally picked up uh, a, a bad case of mycophobia where you start calling mushrooms toadstools and uh, you, you don't use mushrooms in anything uh, and they're considered to be uh, yucky and dangerous. Um, then you can contrast that with the culture in Poland where even little kids go out and pick mushrooms when they're, you know, uh, so there's, it's, it can become a cultural thing. And it's possible that with the First Nations, we're looking at a, a kind of, I don't want to use the word taboo, but a, a cultural gestalt of the whole thing that wasn't that friendly to mushrooms. Mm -hmm. it, it makes me wonder, the mushroom, the mycological community in England, which has been so heavily developed with agriculture and stuff like that, are there fewer mushrooms and fungi in a country like England compared to BC, which is comparatively, apart from clear cutting everywhere, less developed? Or are there just as many in every country of the world? Uh, of different types of mushrooms? Yeah. Oh, they're everywhere. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's hard to cite one place that's having more. There are some, for example, you can compare BC and Alberta. Well, BC has more mushrooms, but we have more different uh, ecosystems here and mm. more microclimates. So generally, the more ecosystems you have, the more different kinds of mushrooms you have. But there are mushrooms in Alberta. They're, you know, uh, so deserts, there are even mushrooms in deserts. We have one essay on, on desert mushrooms in there. Yeah, B BC is a remarkable place to, to study mushrooms or to study any taxonomic group of living organisms. You you select the group and there are more species of that group in BC than in any other province or territory. That certainly applies to mushrooms as well as it applies to bats or worms or bryophytes or any group you choose. Um, a lot of our mushrooms are associated with uh, different tree species. So in some groups of mushrooms, because there is oftentimes a, a higher tree species diversity in some parts of the Carolinian forest, say in Eastern North America, there can be more fungal species there. Conversely, if you look at a set of islands that's as massively deforested as the British Isles, you would have to think that there are fewer mushroom species there 
than when much more of the landscape was covered in trees. So um, someone on iPad is saying, I see people in local community groups and mushroom groups posting regularly about mushrooms in their yard and their concerns that their dogs will eat them and get sick and die. Besides the death cap and maybe the Amanita species, what other mushrooms are there that are a serious risk to pets? Mm. The, uh, <clears throat> the, the this, this whole perspective on mushroom poisoning is often overblown. It's, it, you know, you're, you're, you're relatively unlikely to die of mushroom poisoning even if you eat mushrooms regularly. Uh, but but uh, interestingly, uh, sometimes they have more effect on pets than they do on people. Um, and uh, with dogs, one of the things we've discovered is that the anosophy mushrooms can make them sick. They'll make you sick too, but you tend not to eat them because they're small and they're not pleasant to put in your mouth. Uh, but dogs apparently don't take that view, <laughs> and uh, and they they poison themselves. Do you know, Andy? What other what other species are are is it? Dogs are more likely to. Um, well, they'll occasionally eat gallerinas and things like that. That mm. some of the little brown mushrooms that are really quite poison uh, poisonous. Um, but I strongly suspect that a lot of uh, dogs that are killed by mushroom poisoning are, are killed by other things. Yeah. So Cheryl, Cheryl Bancroft from Wildwood's got an interesting question. She asks, how many fungi that you've documented in the book are introduced species to BC? Ah, that's like a good invasive question. plants like broom and bullfrogs. Sure. The, the obvious one, and we even have a feature two page essay on it, is one of BC's most famous mushrooms, the death cap mushroom. So that's uh, a European species that's been introduced um, really a lot of different places around the globe. Uh, it grows with the roots of a number of European trees like hornbeams and sweet chestnuts. And when those trees are moved around the globe, they oftentimes bring their death cap partner with them. So that's probably, well, that's certainly the most well-known introduced mushroom species in British Columbia. There are a number of things that grow on bark mulch like the the chip cherries, for example, and even some of the magic mushrooms that are likely introduced in British Columbia. Yeah, so Karen Swain, who lives up in Colicum, is saying she's just getting interested and has a large white guild mushrooms that grow on her campsite. She doesn't know what they are. Is there someone she could email pictures to that they might be able to help identify them? And linked to that, has the app iNaturalist become sophisticated enough that it gives you a correct <laughs> identification of local mushrooms and fungi? No, the, I'll, the, I'll, I'll leave the iNaturalist question to Kim. Yeah, the, uh, I, I've been following the iNaturalist work on this over the years and their AI uh, approach uh, to uh, recognizing mushroom photographs has vastly improved over the last several years. Um, probably what, they, what they're claiming right now is that, they're, that if you take a picture of a mushroom, there, there is, a, a, and it's a good, clear picture, and it, it frames the mushroom well, and it's, it's a common mushroom. It's probably about an 80% chance that it will be listed in the top five uh, choices. Uh, so it is it's quite a remarkable program. Uh, but again, I, I, I don't come at this, you know, if, if you're coming at this as a complete amateur, I don't know how you would trust it. It's just, you know, it's just not <laughs> trustworthy. Yeah. But but for people who have a little background in mushrooms, it can suggest some alternatives that they may not have thought of, and that's a good use of it. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, and if you want to have, I'm Andy or I just send us an email. Uh, if you just type my name into Google, you'll find you'll find me. <laughs> I, I'm a Google nonce. Joy is wondering if Strophaeria can grow on alder chips. I'm sure there are Strophaeria species that will grow on alder chips. Is Joy interested, particularly in the um, Strophaeria rugoso annulata, which is the uh, 
the cultivated stropharia that some people grow in their gardens? I'll have to wait till she responds in the chat. <laughs> okay. That one does grow on alder chips. In fact, I have grown it on alder chips. Uh -huh. It will not grow on uh, conifer chips, softwood. Right. So are you still, how often do you discover a new mushroom that, or fungi that you've, is it once a month or every six months or twice a day? We don't discover a lot of new mushrooms. Um, I mean, certainly through the work with Gary Oak, we're finding uh, these genetic sequences of some of the fungi that don't match anything in the published literature. Uh, but until we get to the point where we can actually find fruiting bodies, that is mushrooms, that match the genetic signature of the fungi we find associated with the roots of the Gary Oak, then we won't be able to describe any new species. So neither of us is a taxonomist, a fungal yeah. taxonomist at a university, but there will be eventually some new species coming out of the Gary Oak work. So have you also, well, I'm filling in time already for other questions. Have you been following the work of Merlin Sheldrake in England or Paul Stamets in America, who both written really big best-selling books on fungi? Yes, both. Uh, how do you how fact, do you rank their books and their work? In, in fact, Paul uh, is more of a Cortesian these days than a Washingtonian. He bought <laughs> a bunch of land on Cortez Island, um, and we're hoping to get over to his place soon to do some surveys. Uh, um, I really enjoyed Merlin Sheldrake's book *Entangled Life*. Uh, my favorite popular book. Uh, recently on on mushrooms is by my friend uh, Suzanne Samard uh, called Finding the Mother Tree, which I highly recommend as a, a great read to anyone who's interested. It's even going to be made into a major Hollywood picture now. And, uh, I saw that and she's at UBC. So we, we're going to wrap up very yeah. shortly, but I've got to squeeze in a question from Emily. She says, I've recently found a number of chicken of the woods Mm. I didn't harvest them as I couldn't identify the tree stumps. Is it accurate to say that we should be cautious with the growth of yew trees or will the cooking process help remove the toxins? I've read many differing opinions online. The growth of yew trees. Mm. Chicken of the woods. I'm not sure whether the yew well, trees. There, we, we distinguish the chicken of the woods, two different species, depending on whether it's growing on conifers or on hardwoods. Uh, Latoporus conifer cola, if it's on uh, if it's on softwood uh, conifers, and if it's on hardwood, it's usually Latoporus gilbertsonii. Uh, but they're both edible. Um, yeah, I don't. The, the, the question is whether it's growing on western yew. Yeah, that's if it's going to take up any of the uh, poisonous components that you find in western yew. So most parts of western yew are are poisonous to humans with the possible exception of the, the arils, the little red fleshy berries. And I say possible because I've seen conflicting opinions on that. So uh, given that it's a tree, every part of which is poisonous, I think I would use caution in eating chicken of the woods that was growing on Western U. Yeah, I've, I've never seen anything definitive yeah. about toxins that are transferred to the fungus, but I would uh, urge caution in that regard, certainly. I've never seen it on you, have you? Have I you? have not. Have you? Have you? <laughs> so I'm going to give that. I have not. In, in wrapping up, I'm going to give the final question to Laura Jean Kelly, who asks, will mushrooms save the world? Almost this is your opportunity to philosophize and go big, big, big. Paul Stamets, that question. <laughs> yeah. I, I would say almost certainly the world is not worth saving if it doesn't have those mushrooms in it. <laughs> uh -huh. And Kem, your response? Yeah, uh, yeah sure. Uh, mushrooms are extremely important. People have no idea of the role of fungi in the environment, honestly. Uh, even science is just beginning to look at this, and it's, it's huge. Uh, the whole area of endophytes, for example, these little, little tiny uh, fungi that grow within plants and seem to not harm the plants, 
maybe help the plants. We don't know. Uh, and they're everywhere. Many species have often have several endophyte uh, associates with them. And they're just, you know, they're everywhere. We, we just have no idea how, how important mushrooms are in the world. Yeah, I, I, I think as a general rule, it, I think it's safe to assume that if we didn't have kingdom fungi, there wouldn't be any other life on Earth. Well, so that's fairly important. Yeah, <laughs> relatively, yeah. <laughs> and of course, we share genes with them. It, indeed, we do. Yes, the the closest relatives of kingdom fungi are animals. They're very closely related, uh, evolutionarily, uh, biochemically, physiologically, any way you could think of. Um, so if you, if we go on our foray tomorrow and we see some mushrooms in the forests around Wildwood, people should keep in mind that those mushrooms are much more closely related to them than they are to any plant, for example. Well, they are, they are cousins. Well, look, look, Ken and Andy, this has been fantastic. This is a real gift you've given to us all, not only with your accumulated, I say, 60 years of mushroom hunting and gathering, but in your science and your dedication and your incredible work of laboring to put the book together, but just your, the joy you both clearly have in this thing, and that you're both really fun guys. <laughs> oh, no. So those of us locally up in Yellow Point will delight seeing you tomorrow. And um, otherwise, the book is going to be, you've you said you sold out of the first 5,000 copies, but the reprints will be in bookshops before Christmas. So if you go to your bookshop, you can order a copy and have it in time for Christmas gifts for everyone, correct? Yeah, that's right. We do. So I'm going to do a little fun thing here. If we go to um, full screen, if everyone shares their camera for a minute and gives a little under reactions, you can find a little heart sign and you can give a little, give, send some love to our <laughs> guests tonight by clicking on your reactions and your heart signs. I feel it, yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah so share your cameras, everyone. We can all join in together and send them all a little heart like that right now. <laughs> I, I, I've heard Zoom meetings compared to kissing through a straw. Uh, so it'll be really nice to meet some of you tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to press the red button now and end the meeting. And I hope you have a lovely evening and we'll see you tomorrow. Take care, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Good, Good night. night. Good night.